battle belongs, and it was inspired by a passage in the Bible that tells about Jehoshaphat. And um, they were facing their enemies, and they cried out to God and prayed. And God said, don't worry, don't be afraid, because the battle belongs to me. And I just wanted to encourage people this morning that we can do that. We can pray to God and know that we can hand over our difficulties and our battles to him. And when they had that word, they didn't just go out and uh, do nothing. They praised God. And on the day that they were going to fight the battle, instead of fighting, they walked out. They even employed people to sing praises to God. And they just stood firm in front of their enemy. And the enemy was destroyed without them raising a hand. So I'm going to encourage you to stand with us. And whatever your difficulty or your battle is right now, if you know the song, sing loud. If you don't, just focus on the words and know that you can be praising God and that he can take over your battle for you.
seated. Guys, I have a huge mystery on my hands, and I am going to need the help of some very special helpers this morning. So you see, what's happened is I've discovered some very mysterious items, and I'm going to need your help to figure out who they belong to. I found them lying around. I've taken pictures of them. So I'm going to show you one by one on the screen. And as you look at them, I want you to think, Ooh, who could that possibly belong to? Because I really need to figure out who this is, OK? Um, if you guys can go ahead and maybe put up the first image, that would be helpful. Hmm. Any ideas? No ideas, James? I know. Kind of hard. Yes. You think it's a bracelet? Mmm. That's a great guess. That's a good idea. Oh, a what? Ooh, that's also a great idea. A necklace. Hmm. Okay. A choke necker? I like choke necker. Keep that, dude. Neck choker is what you meant. I got it, dude. No worries. Okay, let's put up the second one. So those were all really great ideas. I need you to keep this in mind. Mm. Ooh, ooh. A pocket knife? I don't know, maybe. A dagger? That's a possibility. Ooh, a sword. Mm. All right. So, all right. So we've got, we've got the first one that kind of looked like a belt or a neck choker or a bracelet. We've got this one that's maybe a knife or maybe a sword. OK, let's go to the third one. A, a coffin. A coffin. All right. Say that, say that again. The boots of peace. The boots of peace? I like it. Sure. Shin guards. Armor. All right. Hmm. Now, we've seen three different pictures so far. Can you maybe put together who it might belong to? Any ideas yet? Say that louder. A soldier. Maybe it belongs to a soldier. Hmm. Interesting. OK, let's, you want to go? David and Goliath, that sounds like we should say something like that when we're in church. Yep, I like it. <laughs> All right, the last picture. <sighs> Hang on, I'm going to get this guy in the back, okay? He hasn't said anything yet. Loud, loud and proud, man. Armor. What part of armor? Where do you think it went? Ooh, on the chest. All right, so that's what, that was the four pieces of evidence I was able to track down, you guys. Any guesses who it might belong to? Oh, I got God. God? God's armor is great, but I'm looking for something a little bit different. James, you got it. What is it? Oh, so it's, it's, it's uh, the ancient peoples. The ancient peoples. Yes, I like the ancient peoples, and that's pretty close because... This equipment belonged to, you can put on my next slide, please, a Roman centurion. What in the world is a Roman centurion? What kind of a name is centurion? Any ideas? A centurion was kind of like a soldier. So all of those belongings that you saw make absolute sense as to who it belonged to. Can't you see it up there? 
Oh, you know what? I missed a really important one. I don't know. I guess I didn't see it up there. It was the helmet. I must have forgotten to take that picture and put it up there. Sorry, guys. That may have given it away. What's really interesting about Roman centurions is that they were people who were really... Oh, there it is. That was supposed to be the last slide, or the... the <laughs> I got the order wrong. You know what? These guys were really important back in Jesus' days. And they were actually people who were super respected. They were respected because a lot of times they had 80 soldiers under them that they had to take care of. And they had to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do and that things were being done properly. A lot of times they wore this important helmet on their head. And if you can see the crest on the top of the head, those were actually made either from horse feathers no, not horse feathers. <laughs> that would have been something to see. Horse hair or feathers. How about I not get my words mixed up? They always carried their sword on the left side. And that was to protect. They wore the, the things on their legs. They're called greaves. And they wore those to what do you think? Protect their legs, right? They always carried a stick, and that stick was really important because it showed that they had like this badge, that they were important. They were an officer, and they could tell you what to do if they wanted to. They were paid more than any other soldier. And so therefore, they were able to buy beautiful equipment for their cavalry. What's a Calvary? A what? A place in Canada. I like that idea. A Calvary is actually an army. So they were able to buy beautiful equipment to be able to fight their enemy. They were really tough men. And as a result, they were actually important enough to be able to have slaves. Now, slaves back then, what they, what the, how they helped this, our soldier was they took care of the horses. They, they kind of did like cleaning and they did things for them that, to help make sure everything was, was kept in order and to perform some of their duties. So these slaves are really important to these Roman centurions. So today, if you are curious what a Roman centurion or a Roman soldier, just another word of saying, just another way of saying it, sticky hands and miracles have in common, I want you to join me upstairs. And we're going to get to talk all about Roman centurions, sticky hands, and miracles. OK? So, James, can you do me a favor? Can you make sure you're signed in so that then we can hang out upstairs? And anybody else who hasn't been able to be signed up, have your mom and dad sign you up over here with, I think Ashton's the one over there. Yay. Whoop, whoop. Thank you, guys. We're just going to wait a moment while everyone that needs to head over there gets over there. All right, I think we're good to continue on. So my name is Susan. I'm an elder here at Southside, and I'm just going to invite you to join with me uh, in prayer now. We're going to put the Lord's Prayer up on the screen, and we will say that together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. The kingdom, the power, and the glory belong to you forever. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. God, we thank you that we've had a chance to sing about your goodness this morning uh, because you are so good to us. And, and we don't deserve all of the, the love and the care that you give to us, God. And we just are so grateful um, for that, for all the gifts that uh, you have given us, um, especially the gift of your son coming to the earth and dying for us. Um, we just pray for the rest of the service now that, um, that our hearts will be open and that we will hear from you. Uh, I pray that um, the words that are sung and spoken will be impactful in our lives and that we will leave here reflecting on them and thinking about them and we will leave here changed um, because you are a God of change and you want to be bringing about new things in our life. And we just pray that we will be open for that and we will be um, listening to what you have for us this morning, God. Um, and we just pray for... Uh, this church congregation, and uh, we just pray for where we are heading in the future. We pray um, for your direction and guidance for us um, in how uh, we grow together as a community and how we love the community of Milton around us, God. We also know that there are people who are, are struggling here this morning um, with um, health challenges, financial challenges, relational challenges, um, or just, just discouragement. Um, I just pray that, that you be with them and you... Um, bring peace upon them, and you bring healing for those who need it, um, comfort for those who are grieving, God. Um, we thank you that you care about every detail of our lives and that nothing is too small um, for you. And so we just, we thank you that we can bring all of our, our concerns to you, God. Um, we love you, and we, we seek to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, and now you can continue on with your worship of God through um, giving of your tithes and offerings. So there are baskets on the table and there are ways on the screen to give as well. Thank you, Susan. There was a well-known author in Western Canada called Philip Keller. And he attended my dad's church in the Okanagan and when we were visiting there, um, Phil Keller and my dad and I used to take walks. They were good friends. And Phil wrote some lovely books. Uh, he wrote, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, A Gardener Looks at the Fruit of the Spirit, and many other devotional kinds of books. And the one time that I was there, we were walking up among the hills and the vineyards of Summerland and Phil was talking to me because my dad kind of prompted him to talk to me. So Phil said, um, what, what do you see here? And it was early fall, so the, the grapevines were lush, purple, beautiful, the sky was blue. And there was a person w w walking among the vines, and he said, that kind of reminds me of a passage in the Bible that's kind of my favorite passage, it's in John 15. And he said the words of John 15, which are these, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. He said that, that fellow there is like the vine dresser. It was a person who was working among the vines and he was um, sort of gathering in his palm a bunch of grapes and looking at them very carefully. And he said, who, who is the vine dresser in John 15? I said, well, I, it's God, right? And he said, yeah. And he said, who is the vine in John 15? And I said, well, Jesus said he was actually the vine. And he said, what's the father doing? And I said, he's looking for fruit on the vines, right? He said, yeah. And then he said, and what's the job of the branch? And I looked at him, and I thought it might be a trick question. And I said, it's to produce fruit, right? He said, wrong. I said, what do you mean wrong? We're in a vineyard. These are grapevines. These are vines. 
these are the fruit, these are the grapes. The branches are producing those grapes. He said, no, it's not the job of the branch to produce grapes. It's the job of the branch. And he said, what does it say in the text? And as I try to recall it, I said, I think it says bear fruit. He says, yeah. The job of the branch is not to produce fruit. It's to bear fruit. And that understanding just tweaked something in my mind um, that sent me scurrying to all the books that I could find about vineyards and the vintners and a South African called Andrew Murray who wrote amazing books about this. But as I reflected on what Phil said and knew that he was a man of kind of unusual wisdom, I thought, I'm, I'm sure he really wanted me to get what he was saying. Well, we went on and he used to write me lovely notes and he now is at home with the vine dresser. But as I was introduced maybe in, in a new way to John 15 by Phil Keller, I have come back to John 15 now maybe as my favorite in all of the Bible. It's about abiding in Christ. And those of you who have been around for a while, you've heard the phrase abiding in Christ. For most of us, the word abiding is not one that we ever use. I mean, how many people use the term abiding this week? You did? How'd you, well, how did you use it? Well, good man. Good man. And will you abide by them? <laughs> I wondered about that. John chapter 15 is at the heart of John's theology and his, his understandings of sanctification, how you become a person who really is blessed. And what we're entering into for quite a while now is an understanding of, of some concepts that will become the practices of our spirituality. And that should not seem very um, frightening to you because it'll be lovely. But I want to just really provide a springboard today for the things that we're going to study for, for several months to come. Because when I come to John 15 and I realize that the responsibility of the branch is to bear fruit, I want to know how you do that. Because bearing fruit, and I've heard delightful stories from many of you about being excited about this season of your lives and our lives. Um, to, to go deeper, to dig into your faith uh, in a way that you maybe have not done before. So when we come to John chapter 15, we are given instructions that I think will properly prepare us for this whole thing. Let me read to you the passage that began with what uh, Phil Keller said to me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and, and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You don't have to listen too long to hear the word abide, right? So apparently the key to bearing fruit having done with the notion that is my job to produce fruit. And if you don't get anything else, get that, that it's not your job. No one is asking you to produce fruit. Your job is to bear fruit. And we then come to the obvious question, how do you bear fruit? And the answer to the question is, you bear fruit by abiding in Christ. But we can't say we're done because we're still going, yeah, what does that mean? 
It's not abiding by the rules, good as though, though that is. It's, it's something else, isn't it? John is my favorite writer. I, I kind of like Paul, but he gets me angry a lot of times. John doesn't. Um, he just says lovely things. And he was the one who was the closest to Jesus. He was the one who was by his cross. He was the one that lived probably the longest life of all of the apostles. And um, he's the one who was called the apostle of love. And when I look at the writings of John, I discover that he has a favorite word. And the favorite word has two forms. Um, we might, um, if we were to transliterate them, we might call them meno and mon, and it doesn't matter. Um, you don't even need to remember those words. But all the way through the New Testament, there is this word um, that in what I have read is, is translated abide. John, if we were to consider the use of this term, John uses that term 69 out of the 100 times it's used in the New Testament, which means he uses the term 57.5% of the times anybody uses it. And as you can see, the majority of those words are right there in John 15, right? He loves that word. That word, um, we were first introduced to it in John, when some followers of John the Baptist um, come to Jesus and they're intrigued by him and they ask him a question. They say, where are you staying? And Jesus' answer is delightful. He says, come and see. That's the word. Where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. And then we're told, and that day they stayed with him. So if there was a rabbi who was inviting candidates for discipleship, um, they would not show up for classes every morning. They would not show up for church once a week. They would literally move in with the rabbi. So when they asked him, where are you staying? They were asking him the question, where can we come to find you and stay with you? How can we hang out with you? And as we begin our understandings, or maybe seek for a renewal of our understandings of discipleship, we've kind of gone Western on that. And for a long time, we have thought of discipleship as a set of courses, right? A set of things to learn. Um, and once you've learned all those things, you graduate from the school of discipleship. When Jesus was inviting people to follow him as their rabbi, as their master, he didn't say, well, if you're going to be my disciples, you'll have to make sure you are good at these things. He didn't talk about um, competence or chemistry. He didn't talk about how you qualify to be a disciple. He said, you want to know how to follow me? You're asking the first very appropriate question. Where do you live? Like, where are you staying? And Jesus did not say, uh-oh, hang on a second. You know, I need to keep my boundaries. Um, that, that's being facetious. But he said, come and see. And they did, and they stayed. Another time, and these two will kind of bookend what I want to bring us to. Another time that the term is used is in John 14, in verse 2. And Jesus is saying to these very disciples, don't be troubled. You believe in God, you also believe in me. In my Father's house, there are many places to dwell, to hang out, to stay, to abide. And one of the most beautiful things about um, the privilege of conducting funerals, <laughs> which sounds rather morbid, is to bring people to John 14 and say that what Jesus said is still true, that where he has gone is to prepare an abiding place for you. Just like he said to the disciples, come and see, come hang out with me. He said at the end of his life, I, I'm leaving here, but I'm going to prepare that kind of a place. Um, we're going to talk about the word home. Because I think the word home is the best translation in our day, in our culture, 
of all of the uses of that term by John as he explores what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to really bear fruit in our lives. When I'm able to say to people, your dad has gone home. He hasn't gone to some strange place. He hasn't gone to something above the clouds where he floats around. He has gone somewhere that is home to him. Like, it's not strange. It's not weird. It's not full of activities that are really awkward for him. When he stopped breathing on earth, he woke up in heaven, and it was home. Now, as we have mentioned several times about N.T. Wright, and he talks about the fact that it's the life after the life after death that really matters. And if you get your head around that, you've got your head around a lot of current theology. What he says is that the use of this term in the New Testament days would have talked about a way station along the way, which is also a beautiful idea, that when a weary traveler finds an inn, he has found this word. He has found a place that if it is doing its job, it's going to feel like home when he goes there. Uh, but according to N.T. Wright, that's not where we stop. But for the, for the meantime between this life and the next, between uh, the kingdom coming and already arrived, um, there's a place that we go that we can comfort one another by saying, it's, it's like home. It's just like home. I mean, it'll feel like you've just, you've pulled up that comfortable old chair by the fire and you've lit your pipe or whatever you do and you feel like, wow, this just feels like home. Here's the way um, Eugene Peterson translates that passage. Um, and having understood the number of times that the exact term abide is used, and asking ourselves the question, how do we bear fruit by abiding? Well, we better understand what it means to abide. So here's what Peterson says. I am the real vine and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes, and every branch that is grape-bearing, he prunes back so that it will bear even more. Which is something that is pastorally very useful in talking to people. Um, God does prune us, but rarely to punish us, right? He prunes us to get more fruit. And when people, in my experience, kind of grasp that and they say, hmm, how is God pruning me? How will there be more fruit in my life and by my life because of this difficulty? Well, we know that the Father uses pruning shears, and they hurt, but that they're so that we can bear more fruit. He says, uh, you're already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me. So I've put sort of a highlight, sort of green, where the word abide is in the original. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relationship intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home, same word, with me, and my words are at home, same word, in you, you can be sure that whatever you, you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, and Peterson shouldn't have said produce, he should have said bear, but you know, he's in heaven and he knows better now. When you mature as my disciples, I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. What does it mean to abide in Christ? It means to make ourselves at home with him. I want to talk about making sure that we stay close to home. 
Have you thought about the number of, of animals uh, and birds and so on that have a homing instinct? It's amazing, isn't it? Um, the salmon that we used to see coming back to spawn in the Okanagan and off the Pacific, they come back to spawn where they were hatched. The whales, they come back. And you know that I've been rather disparaging about cats. Well, let me just redeem my reputation about cats. There's a cat called Sooty, whose family moved 100 miles away from home in England, and Sooty found its way home. Tigger, a three-legged cat, traveled three miles back to its family 75 times. I don't know if its parents didn't really want it and put it out, <laughs> but it found its way back. Ninja, uh, he was a tomcat whose owners moved from Utah to Washington, to Washington State. And this cat went back to Utah a hundred or 850 miles away a year later. So I have new respect for cats. <laughs> How in the world do cats find their way home? How do many birds find their way home? We've talked a bit about natural theology and there's hardly anything in nature that doesn't teach us something. There's hardly anything that doesn't have God's mark on it. And when I see salmon spawning, and I hear sort of an evolutionary description of why that happens, it makes sense. But who's behind all of that, the design of all of that? Um, when I see the beauty of God's creation and know that he has left his mark, and even though it is fallen, just as we are, um, I can learn so many, so many important things. I think God has built into the human person a homing instinct. He has built into us the desire for home. And I know that, that even the term home begins to resonate with many of us, if not all, and it means something to go home. Sadly, it means that we go someplace that we thought was home, and guess what? It's not home anymore. When I went back to Ireland the first time, I thought I was going home. It still looked the same, they still talked the same funny way, but it wasn't home anymore. C.S. Lewis's writings are full of this nostalgia for home. It's like his predominant theme. Germans call it Sehnsucht. Where are the Germans among us? What does Sehnsucht mean? There you go. Longing for something. Into every human heart, God has, has designed this longing, and the thing we're longing for is home. It, it's a longing that stretches back to what we were created for and with. It's also a longing that stretches forward, that says there's something that we've not yet seen. So Lewis's terms are the, the flower whose who's scent um, speaks about a flower that we've never yet seen been able to smell. It's, it's, you know, the story from a faraway journey. It's, it's, it's the lifelong pursuit of the answer to the longing in our hearts. And if we were to ask John what his understanding would be, he would say, well, back to John 15. If you want to be a person who is fully blessed, as in someone who really bears fruit, if you want to be really fruitful in your life, Get at the longing in your heart. Get at the home sense that's in your heart and live into it. Don't stray too far from home. And I think for many of us, if we were honest, the home that we know, the home that we trusted ourselves to, the home that even in our faith we began to believe towards, when we get too far away from that home, we get anxious, we get disturbed, and we have a longing that's not satisfied. And we chase after so many ways to satisfy the longing. And the longing is for a very simple thing. It's a longing to be at home. To be at home 
in Jesus, with Jesus. And here's the powerful point for today. It's not only about what was created in us or what we're destined for. It's the way we are to live our lives now. We're to live with home on our radar. Um, my car has a very strange GPS. It has a quirky feature. It tries to understand where I'm going to go and then tells me to go there. And so I say, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to this other place. So my home um, in, in my GPS is Frederick Drive in Guelph. And so it'll show that up. It's also a whistle bear where I go and do a lot of weddings. There's a whole lot of other things. And they're all properly labeled and asks me, do you want to go there? And here's how long it'll take you. Here's the best way to go. Here's where there's traffic or where there are accidents. It also has 200 main on the screen. But it calls that home. I don't know why. I never told it this was home. But it's sort of like, you know, God's going, hey, hey, hey. Would you please pay attention? Your whole life is supposed to be at home. Your whole life, your whole orientation needs to be around the notion of home. I think it's a wonderful promise that John gives us as he gives us this beautiful picture of, of the glorious vineyard where he says that there's, and there is maybe very few things that match the, the gorgeous vista of a row of, of grapes in the Okanagan or the Niagara Peninsula or wherever your favorite grapes and wine are pr produced. It's a luscious, luscious vision. And what we're proposing is that there are ways that we can live into the truth of being not far away from home that will be best experienced by things like observing Sabbath, by the way that we practice prayer, um, by the many other ancient practices that the church has engaged itself in, by which we slow down and we pay attention and we look for home and orient ourselves towards home. The way that Jesus describes how that works in, in John 15 is that he says it's about the way he abides in us and we abide in him. Um, I was told by a vintner that there's, there's something that happens. Uh, he had a term for it, but I'm not a vintner, so I won't remember it. It's something mystical, but not mystical, that happens as the branch reaches into the vine. He said that there is a, a nourishment and more that flows up from the vine and grows into the branches, that the branch reaches down into the vine and takes nourishment, takes nourishment. Some of the people that have impressed me more than anyone else or anything else have been simple people who, who describe what it's like for them to be in love with Jesus. Simple as that, it's like, um, a dear friend of, of mine that was the father of, of one of our, our, our good friends that we camped with every year in, in Osoyas, Bob would come and he would look for me and I would see him coming and he would say, what's Jesus showing you about himself and in his word today? And he never said it without tears in his eyes as this dad-aged person coached me along and said, is it like that for you? Like are you delighted by the truth of God's word? Are you delighted by the fact that Jesus abides in you and you abide in him? In essence, he was asking me, is, is that process happening that I am reaching up into Jesus to draw his life into me that I then in turn might bear fruit? We live our lives with the burden of producing fruit, of producing bad fruit, of producing no fruit because we thought it was our job. Um, but when we get to the understanding that living the fruitful life is living at home, it is as natural as anything that is actually natural is to live a fruitful life. But we can be distracted. We can be sure that the thing we want is something else. It's something faster than the speed of love. 
It's something quicker than what happens by meditation. It's something um, that isn't bothered by having to stop for Sabbath. And that was the predicament in the Old Testament. They did Sabbath, but while they did it, they just said, when must Sabbath be over so we can go back to being crooks? That's not the Lord's Sabbath. Jesus said, um, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God has given us a gift that we're going to explore, the gift of Sabbath, that says, slow down. Maybe this week you've forgotten a bit that you need to live near home. And this is a time for you to say, okay, yeah, everything else gets put aside. I'm going to go home. I'm going to hang out there. As you think about the word home, I encourage you to try to find phrases and sentences in which the term is used. And see if it doesn't evoke in you some longing that says, yeah, that is what I want. A long trip, maybe it was a beautiful trip, a great vacation. And what do you say when you get home? Oh, the Dominican was great, but it's good to be home, right? I've traveled sometimes to, to many parts of the world far, far away. And, and there's a really weird feeling when you're thousands and thousands and thousands and hours and hours and hours away from home. Do you think, if something were to go wrong, I, I couldn't get home, right? If, if the airplane stopped flying, I could not get home. And there's a bit of a distress that comes in that feeling that longs to get home. So it's been two or three weeks, and oh, I'm longing to get home. I hope my flight's on time. I hope nothing happens. Because being away from home disquiets my soul, even when it's about the kingdom and about um, what God is doing around the world. Do you love home? And if home is a place that's a problem for you, then that's what you need to do work on is to say, why has home not been for me what it should be? What's wrong there? Um, and how can we fix it? Who can help us fix it? But if home is that feeling that is evoked in you that makes you say, yeah, that's what I want, I promise you the only place that you can find home is in the slowness and the deliberateness of living into the ways Followers of Jesus for millennia have followed him carefully and slowly. And if you want that depth of quality of life, um, I don't know any better way than to go back to the ways that we're going back to together. We're going to learn. We're going to go slowly. We're going to review. But I know that God has great blessings in store for you, for us. Do you stay in your home? Is there a place in your life, maybe in your house, um, where you make sure that you're going back home, you're orienting yourself to home? Is there a place where you're orienting yourself to God's word, which Jesus says is critical, it's abiding in his word and in his love, and him then flowing into you? Do you have a dilemma that you've not given the space and the time for scripture to enter your life, your head, your heart? Do you read through the Psalms when you need something that just brings the feeling, brings the, even the permission to say, I'm not doing well, or I'm wishing for that? Well, the Word of God, it's brilliant. It's, it, it is a compendium of the story of people's experiences with God for thousands and thousands of years. Do we have some problems with it? Yeah, we do. We get problems. Annabeth gets problems in the Old Testament, and she comes up to me and says, I have a question for you, and I, I just have to say, stop reading the Bible. <laughs> so we have problems, but not when we see what that is. I mean, John is unique, and yet the Spirit of God was using John's personality and John's words to say what he wanted to say, and yet, for us, John says, by the way, if you didn't notice, I love the word abide. I love it, love it, love it. So I trust that something in, in what we're seeing in John chapter 15 calls to your heart and calls to your longing and says, I, that's what I want. That's who I want. So I'm in. So why don't we pray together? Father, we thank you for the profound 
teaching about abiding in Christ. And as the, the, the Celts would say, bide a while. May, may we bide a while with Jesus in his word, in his disciplines. Um, may we find his life flowing into our lives and then producing fruit because it is the life that we need and that we just simply get to bear it. Thank you for the many ways that we see fruit as it is born by friends of ours, even right here in this room. Thank you that we can notice that it's in the, it's in the quietness of their lives and the quietness of their hearts uh, that you work and you, you do the, um, the, the hard work of producing beautiful fruit. May we notice in nature every way that you've uh, given us a witness to yourself. May we realize that uh, there is a homing instinct in all of us, and it's to come home to you. So for some father who this morning are identifying the fact that they're, they're just a bit too far away from home in some way in their lives, just let them know that your arms are open for them to come back, and the life of your son is their life as they live into the truth of who he is and who they are in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand or sit, as you feel comfortable. Jesus.